You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 10, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, severe asthma in children. Our presenter is Dr. Leonard Becarrier. He's the Janie Robinson and John Moore Lee Chair in Pediatrics in the Section of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Today is September 10th, 2021, and we are pleased to have uh, Dr. Leonard Bacarrier join with us this morning to give our first lecture. Um, Dr. Bacarrier is a professor of pediatrics in allergy, immunology, and pulmonary medicine, and the scientific director at the Center for Clinical and Translational Research at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Bacarrier's career has focused on clinical research to help understand, understand and improve the care of children with asthma. His clinical and translational research efforts are directed at the pathogenesis of asthma in early life and approaches to asthma management throughout childhood, including a multi-center, federally funded uh, clinical trials in asthma. He will be speaking today about the evaluation of severe asthma in children. Um, the time's all yours, Dr. Precarier. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate the opportunity to, to join the lecture series again this year and uh, uh, spend some time with uh, the group and talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, which is severe asthma in children. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. You'll see that I have uh, financial interests with all of the manufacturers of basically every medication we use to treat asthma, so you can take those in the appropriate context. I'm also a member of the Science Committee of GINA, and when I use GINA-related documents, you'll understand why. Uh, here are the general learning objectives of uh, today's discussion. Talk about heterogeneity and pediatric asthma. Review a systematic and phenotype-driven approach toward uh, the management of severe asthma. And think about a little bit more about how to think about uh, which patients may be candidates for biologics uh, approved for asthma. So the first thing we do is try to define severe asthma. And uh, if, while that would seem to be a simple and straightforward task, it never really is. Um, every paper you read will define it a little differently. Here are at least two definitions, one from the Global Initiative from Asthma and one from the ERS-ATS combined guidelines. And what's, what's common about these is that the, the, the level of severity is really defined by the amount of therapy required to either achieve control or despite all that therapy, um, asthma remains uncontrolled. In GINA, that means step four or five treatment. That's generally medium to high dose ICS with or without a lot, but to prevent um, asthma from being uncontrolled or uncontrolled despite that. ATSERS is, again, steps four or five therapy uh, from GINA. But it also acknowledges that if a patient requires oral corticosteroids for at least half the year to maintain control or remains uncontrolled, that that's an indication of severe asthma. 50% of the year seems like a lot of the year, and I would suspect that people who don't need it 50% but still need it for a substantial fraction have severe asthma nonetheless. So if we think about childhood asthma in the entire universe that that represents, it's important to remember that we see most of our patients who can achieve good control with standard asthma therapy. So we're already talking about a smaller subset of patients. And that's asthma that remains difficult to treat. And when we think about difficult to treat asthma, and we'll talk about this a little more in the upcoming slides, we, we need to think about why asthma doesn't respond to asthma therapy. And a very common reason that asthma doesn't respond to asthma therapy is because it's not asthma. So asthma diagnosis is often a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to think through a differential diagnosis um, before escalating care. So incorrect diagnosis really is a, is a not uncommon uh, manifestation of difficult to treat asthma. Asthma may be difficult to treat, not necessarily because the asthma is uh, problematic, but because there's a complicating factor, a comorbid condition, poor drug delivery, poor drug 
uh, therapy adherence, all of those factors make asthma look more difficult to treat. But if those factors are dealt with appropriately, the asthma actually becomes quite manageable. And then there are the patients who have true severe therapy resistant disease that despite the, the standard of care medications used appropriately with all other factors being taken into consideration, asthma still remains difficult to manage. But not all severe asthma is difficult. There are patients who have severe asthma who, when receiving appropriate therapy, are well controlled, and that's wonderful. And then there's severe asthma that's either on or undertreated or underappreciated. So as we think about separating the difficult to treat asthma patient from the severe therapy resistant patient, there's about a half a dozen evaluation and considerations that really should uh, be put into place. Treatment adherence probably is at the top of the list because most asthma responds to asthma therapy. And if your patient isn't taking the therapy as intended, maybe that's the reason improvement is less than expected. Environmental exposures are substantial. This group doesn't need to hear more about that. Psychosocial issues are a real complicating factor in asthma. And um, we can all do better at acknowledging them, asking about them, and helping our patients find resources to deal um, with those in, in the most effective manners. Comorbidities need to be considered. Allergic sensitization is, is a component. Evaluation of lung function, airway structure, cytology, and corticosteroid responsiveness all help differentiate whether a patient has difficult to treat disease or true severe treatment resistant disease. So not all severe asthma is the same. Um, much of this work has been done and talked about in adults. I'm going to share with you um, some work that we've done in, in children to help show that many of the concepts that have been identified and discussed in the adult space hold true in children. And these are the findings that we had in the Inner City Asthma uh, Consortium's APIC study. And this is a study where we enrolled 6 to 17-year-old children who lived in the inner city, had a physician diagnosis of asthma, but we didn't restrict their asthma severities because this was an observational study. We took anyone who came in with asthma. It's a 12-month prospective study. We saw them regularly in standardized and administered guideline-based care of both asthma and rhinitis and provided medications to the patients. We saw them every two months, adjusted their treatment based on their clinical assessments. And going into the study, we thought that we would have um, three groups of children in the end. And if they came to at least four of their six visits, we called them easy to control if their disease was well managed on 50 micrograms a day or less of fluticasone, Montelukast alone, or they didn't require controller at all. We called them difficult to control if they needed at least 250 micrograms twice a day of fluticasone with or without a lava. And anybody in between we called indeterminate. So three levels, but the, real, the only two that we're going to talk about are easy and difficult to control. We then did a, you know, the very popular cluster analysis to try to figure out how these patients sort of group themselves in a unsupervised fashion. And what we found is that the model that best explained this study population had five different clusters or phenotypes called A through E on this slide. The one I want you to focus on first is phenotype E. And all of these factors are color-coded. The darker the blue, the higher the, the value is for any given factor. And what we see is that they have the highest degree of asthma severity, the lowest degree of airway function, the greatest extent of bronchodilator response, the highest amount of rhinitis disease and medication use at screening. They were the most polysensitized, averaging 14 positive um, uh, aeroallergen sensitivities out of a panel of 22. They had a mean serum IgE of, of 616. They had eosinophilic disease with an average eosinophil count of 400. And their pheno, despite whatever therapy they were on at baseline, was the highest, the 27. That is what everybody would have called type 2 high severe childhood eosinophilic allergic asthma, right? That's what that is. But then move over and look at column B. Cluster B. These are patients who also had pretty substantial disease severity. They had symptom scores that were comparable to the 
to the cluster E children. They were on step four therapy, just like the cluster E children. They had lung function that was far from normal, but not quite as obstructed. They had a little less rhinitis, but certainly substantial amounts. But their aeroallergen sensitization was pretty modest, less than 2 out of 22. Total IgE is only 70. Their eosinophil count averaged 200, and their pheno was 14. So these are children who have what looks like severe asthma, but is a type 2 not so high. Maybe it's low, maybe it's not so high. Um, and then there were children like column A, who had mild, mild, mild disease, who didn't have a lot of A to B. There were children in group D who had more A to B, but their asthma just wasn't as severe. And group C was a highly allergic but minimally impacted group from an asthma perspective. So similar to what has been described in adults. We then wanted to understand what were the factors that made a patient difficult to control. And it were those who had persistently low lung function, those who showed seasonal variability in the fall and winter, and who had a higher frequency of exacerbations. So the factors that you would have thought identify difficult to control disease were indeed those. Low lung function, symptom variability, and higher uh, frequency of uh, exacerbations. Now, here's some work we did as part of the Severe Asthma Research Program, and this is, I think, a little counter to our usual conventional thinking. What we see here is a group of children enrolled um, and followed prospectively for three years, and they came in with mild to severe disease. And on the left, you see one of these Sankey plots that shows how the proportions of severe disease in blue and non-severe disease in green displayed themselves year upon year. And what you saw is that over the three years of follow-up, about half the children who had severe disease at baseline were no longer considered severe. And, you know, we didn't manage their therapy. Um, maybe they got more adherent. Maybe they ended up on more therapy, whatever it was. Um, this is kind of counter because we've, we've always said that severe asthma tends to persist. But here we see that maybe the prognosis is a little more promising. You know, we, we often talk about the gender shift that occurs at puberty, but we didn't really see that in this population. There was no difference between males and females in resolution rates. And we talk about type 2 disease as being the most common and the one most associated with severe disease. But it turns out in a relatively paradoxical way that the higher your eosinophil count was at baseline, the more likely you were to actually resolve your severe asthma and become less severe. So eosinophilic asthma is not necessarily a predictor of persistence of disease, at least in this population of 135 children. So when we see a patient with severe asthma, how might one think through this process? I'm going to share two algorithms that I think are valuable. This is one we developed as part of the Severe Asthma Clinic for Kids at WashU. And our first question that we ask is, is the patient controlled? And sometimes the answer is actually yes. And then the next step is to consider a step down in therapy. But more often than not, they're not controlled. That's why they're coming to see us. And we then ask, are they on a maximal level of therapy? And if they're not, we ask, why is that? And is that because of an adherence issue? And if they're highly adherent, and everything else seems to check out, a step up of therapy and considering of confirmation of asthma seems the appropriate next step. But if they're not adherent, we need to understand why and not just tell them you need to take your medicine because that doesn't work. And this is where we would assess the barriers to care. And these barriers come in really four categories. The first is economic. Can they afford the medicines? Can they afford to come to your visits? Can they afford... Um, to, to, to seek and uh, acquire care appropriately. And parents will answer this question honestly if you ask it. Beliefs, what do they think about asthma? Do they believe their child has asthma? Do they believe these therapies work? Do they believe they're safe? Do they have concerns about side effects or others that you need to work on? Because if, if we can't help them think through their beliefs, we're not gonna help them get better. What are the social barriers? 
Um, you know, what are the issues at school? Is there support at school? Can they get their treatments at school? Family dynamics are more complicated now than ever. Who's in, ch in charge of the medicines? There are a lot of seven-year-olds in charge of their own asthma medicines. That is not a ticket to success for most of them. They have multiple caregivers, all of whom have their own barriers and ideas that may impact how um, care is delivered at home. And then health literacy, and, and I think we, we all need to pay very close attention to this. Do they really understand what asthma is? Do they understand the difference between all those inhalers that we give them? Do they understand, you know, that it's a chronic disease? If they don't, how can we expect them to do their jobs well? Now, if you're on maximal therapy already, again, ask the adherence questions. And if the adherence questions show no, go back and reassess the barriers to adherence. If they are adherent, think about comorbidities, obesity, depression, reflux, sleep apnea, upper airway disease, high risk behaviors, and reconsider the cough and differential diagnosis of cough and wheeze. And, you know, we, we're not going to go through this. You all know this stuff, but you've got to go through it time and time again because these get overlooked. They get missed. Some of them develop over time. Um, so as, as, you know, all of the fellows who've ever worked with me have heard, the patient doesn't have asthma until we say they have asthma. It doesn't matter if they came in from anywhere else with a diagnosis of asthma. Let's confirm it for ourselves. The alternative diagnoses are construction. Sorry? Sorry? Is there a question? Sorry. All right, so think about structural abnormalities. The younger the child, the more likely there is to be um, something other than asthma going on. But just because the child is a little older doesn't mean they don't have a structural abnormality. Made many of these diagnoses in children way older than the typical average age of presentation. Um, foreign bodies still get inhaled. If you don't ask about them, if you don't think about them, um, inhaled steroids don't dissolve any of them. Dysfunctional breathing, panic attacks, vocal cord dysfunction, gastroesophageal reflux with or without microaspiration, cystic fibrosis becoming less and less commonly missed with universal newborn screening, immune abnormalities, bronchiectasis, BPD, bronchial isobliterans. The list goes on and on. You need to think about it um, as, as part of your evaluation. You know, as we move into the diagnosis and management, <coughs> I refer you to the Gina Pocket Guide on Difficult to Treat and Severe Asthma in Adolescents and Adults. We are working on one of these for uh, children. Hope to have that ready for folks next week. We're going to look at several of the decision trees that are embedded in this. You can find this online at ginaasthma.org slash severe asthma. Download it. Commit it to memory. Your patients will benefit. And this is the general approach, and it's very similar to what we've talked about. We see somebody who we believe has difficulty to treat asthma. First off, we want to confirm the diagnosis and look for the contributing factors. And here, you know, we, we point out incorrect inhaler technique, adherence, comorbidities, modifiable risk factors, overuse of SABA inhalers, side effects, anxiety, depression, and social difficulties. Before we step up, we optimize. We provide education. We provide inhaler technique. We treat it, comorbidities and modifiable risk factors. We need to remember that there are non-biological add-ons still out there. LABAs, long-acting muscarinics, leukotriene modifiers. Um, in older patients, maybe azithromycin. Think about the other things that make asthma likely to do better, smoking cessation, weight loss, exercise, yearly flu shot. Um, and if they haven't had a trial of high-dose inhaled corticosteroids, we recommend one of those. But given the relatively flat dose response curve, that usually doesn't solve the problem, and we usually end up going back to medium dose. Patients at this level who are not meeting the goals of asthma care really should have been referred to a specialist or severe asthma clinic. And then we want to see them back and review their response in three to six months, maybe two months, maybe four months, whatever it is, but you need to see them back and ask, is asthma still uncontrolled? And if not, try to reduce therapy and see what happens. If it becomes uncontrolled when you step down, go back up and you've assessed that you've confirmed a diagnosis of severe asthma. When we think about adherence, remember that it 
Poor adherence can occur for a variety of reasons. It can be unintentional or intentional. Some patients really don't understand why they're non-adherent. But almost every patient will tell you if they're non-adherent if you ask the questions in empathetic, understanding, non-judgmental ways. And if you do that, you will get a sense as to what's going on, and you will help understand what their beliefs and concerns are that might allow you to either reassure them, find a different medication that doesn't generate those concerns, whatever it is. But if you don't ask these questions and you just rely on, on sending the newest medication to their pharmacy, you're going to end up exactly where you started. Um, shared decision-making has is, is been shown to be effective. Home nursing visits have been shown to be effective. Inhaler reminders improve adherence. It's unclear whether they actually improve disease control. Um, and often we'll review patients' dispensing records to really understand what they're doing. So let's now transition to therapy for the rest of our discussion. And let's do this in the context of a patient that we took care of. So there's a five-year-old boy, asthma since age two, no symptoms since infant, been, and has been symptomatic really since infancy. He has an exacerbation just about every month. And nearly every day, he has some degree of asthma symptomatology, be it cough, wheeze, and that certainly worsens in the setting of physical activity. He coughs at night, wakes up once or twice a week. Five hospital admissions per year. Fortunately, none required intensive care unit and none required uh, mechanical ventilatory support. He was being controlled on nebulized budesonide, a half a milligram twice a day. When that wasn't effective, they went up to medicine for Motorol. 100, that didn't work, so went to Mometasone for Motorol, 200. Received Montelukast, 4 milligrams daily, and for his allergic rhinitis, loratadine and intranasal fluticasone. He had allergic rhinitis confirmed by allergy skin testing. He had an abnormal polysomnogram and then was scheduled for follow-up with ENT. Couldn't find risks of child or parent depression, and he was at low risk for reflux. Even though he's five, he is a very capable spirometry blower. His lung function showed marked airflow obstruction, and this was not in the midst of exacerbation. This is just in a routine clinic visit. FEV1, 63% predicted. FEV1, FEC ratio obstructed at 60%. Provide him albuterol. His FEV1 normalizes, goes up 59% to 99% predicted, but his ratio still remains below the lower limit of normal. So he's got obstruction despite being bronchodilator responsive. He was unable to perform a pheno test. We did a sweat chloride that was normal. We did a chest CT that showed some bronchial thickening, increased anteroposterior posterior diameter, but no other diagnostic findings. He had an airway evaluation with bronchoscopy and BAL, a little bit of edema, a little bit of secretions, grew more XL, and got a course of septin here for that. Peripheral blood eosinophilia was substantial at over 1,000 per microliter. His IgE uh, was markedly elevated at 4,700, and as noted earlier, his skin tests were positive to multiple, both seasonal and perennial aeroallergens. Called the pharmacy, evaluated that. 10, to, 10 out of the last 12 months, they had filled their inhaled corticosteroid controller. That's about as good as any family can really do. It is hard to imagine his lack of control um, is because of, of that. Um, his inhaler technique was good. The family believed in his diagnosis. They did, we were unable to identify any clear barriers. Um, they came to all their visits. These were model patients and a child who just was not achieving the goals of care. So how might we think about stepwise care for this child? Here are the, um, on the left, the NAEPP 2020 update, and on the right, uh, the GINA 2021 set of recommendations for children around this age. What we see is he is clearly in the, the most severe um, range of uh, disease, and it would require, by NAEPP, step five or six care. And in GINA, we only go up to step four in children five and under. Um, in GINA for step four, it's basically um, inhale corticosteroid, consider LTRA, um, and refer for subspecialty evaluation because truthfully, under age five, the data are pretty minimal. But he's almost six, so how, how, if he were a little older, what would we think about? So on the GINA side, he would now be step five. He'd be referred for phenotypic assessment. That's what we just talked about. Add-on therapy, such as anti-IgE, anti-L5. Could consider low-dose chronic oral corticosteroids, but we really don't like doing that. 
um, can consider add-ons like teotropium. Um, it's important to remember what we mean by high-dose inhaled corticosteroids in young children because it really isn't as much as some folks think it is. So here's the table from the GINA document reminding us how much or truthfully how little inhaled corticosteroid qualifies as high-dose. You know, for budesonide, it's 1,000 micrograms a day. For fluticasone in the meter dose inhaler, it's 200 micrograms a day. So these, it, it's not saying these are equivalent, but this is what is considered high-dose inhaled corticosteroid in this age group. As we noted earlier, there's a relatively modest res dose response to inhaled corticosteroids. And going from moderate to high dose usually doesn't buy you much clinical benefit, but probably exposes some side effects. Maybe in some patients, high dose inhaled corticosteroids help, especially if there's low adherence. So we usually try it, but I usually do it for a relatively short period of time. And if there isn't clear improvement, I go back down to moderate dose. It's unclear if small particle inhaled corticosteroids, either given alone or in addition to conventional ICS, are more effective. Some folks try that, have not had um, overwhelming success with that. But it is important to remember that there's increased risk of adrenal suppression and growth retardation with increasing doses and duration. Oral corticosteroids are the enemy. We need to do everything in our power to minimize our, our patients' exposures to these medicines. They are given very, very easily at urgent care. They're given by pediatricians. They're given by specialists. They're given over the phone without evaluating a patient um, directly. And it's pretty remarkable when you look at these large databases the real risk associated with this. This is a huge study of four and a half million um, children and adolescents from Taiwan. And they looked at those who had a course of oral corticosteroids for any reason within the past 14 days. And they looked at, at, GI, at corticosteroid side effects like GI bleeding, sepsis, pneumonia, and glaucoma within the next five to 30 days and then 31 to 90 days. It's important to see here that uh, almost a quarter of all the children received a single oral corticosteroid burst. So this is really common and most often for acute respiratory tract illnesses, whether or not that's asthma. And what you see on the right is that a single burst of oral steroids increased the risk of GI bleeding about twofold, increased the risks of both sepsis and pneumonia. Didn't do anything for glaucoma, but in children, that's pretty rare to begin with. And the risk goes down in the next 30, in the next 60 days, but there is a clear risk of these non-trivial outcomes from a course of oral steroids. What about fracture? Here's a, here's a recent paper um, looking at oral steroids in the setting of asthma. And what they saw is that filling a single prescription for a systemic steroid was associated with a 17% increase in odds of a fracture compared with never filling a prescription. This risk was greater in girls and seemed to be greatest in the children in the 10 to 13 age range. So we really do need to be cognizant about how and when we use oral corticosteroids to use as little of them for as short a period of time as possible um, because their side effects are non-trivial. When we assess the severe asthma phenotype, this is the next step in the GINA algorithm for severe asthma. We want to look for evidence of type 2 inflammation and signs that that may be present include eosinophil counts of at least 150, pheno of at least 20, sputum, if you do that, of at least 2%, clinically allergen-driven asthma, or need for oral steroids. It's important to know that all of these measures are variable over time. These are not static measures in our patients. So it's important that if your patient doesn't quite have evidence of type 2 inflammation, you might want to repeat these studies another two or three times, maybe in different clinical states. I will often give patients a prescription for a CBC. So if they find themselves going to an ED for an acute asthma exacerbation, um, and we have not been able to demonstrate eosinophilia at baseline. I asked them to get a, a CBC and look for eosinophilia before they give oral steroids. That may be the way you catch it.
You want to investigate for comorbidities and the differential diagnosis using all the tools that we know are available, thinking about uh, ADPA, thinking about other aeroallergen sensitivities, thinking about EGPA, depending on clinical su suspicion. Um, consider the need for social and psychological support. Use multidisciplinary care where available. And then think about non-biologics. Think about ways to mo modify and maximize adherence. Think about a transient increase in ICS dose to see if this is one of those patients who might respond to just a little extra. Think about AERD, ABPA, chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, all of these, the type 2 disorders. If you don't have evidence of type 2 inflammation, think about the differential diagnosis again. Most asthma in children is type 2. So if you're not seeing evidence of type 2, ask yourself again, is this asthma? The answer is it could be but have another level of uncertainty. Think through the other factors that are there. Think about infection, think about exposures, think about doing a high-res CT, looking for other um, factors. And then think about adding on a type 2 biologic if indeed type 2 disease is present. So the biologics target a variety of elements of the inflammatory pathway that is asthma. We'll talk about several of these in the next uh, few minutes, but it's important to acknowledge that we have lots of therapies now to talk about for those who have type 2 eye disease. We have little to nothing at the present time to really talk about for patients for whom we don't demonstrate evidence of type 2 inflammation. Times may bring in some new uh, opportunities, but right now, what we're going to talk about are therapy for those who have type 2 disease. This is the GINA approach for how to think about um, which type 2 biologic to consider adding on. And you would consider this in patients with exacerbations or poor symptom control on medium to high dose ICS LABA who have evidence of either allergic or eosinophilic biomarkers and or need for maintenance oral corticosteroids. And what we see are the things that we would think about in the context of anti-IgE. So you need to demonstrate allergic sensitization. Your IgE needs to be in, within the range for dosing and for weight. And you want to see patients who've had exacerbations. For those who may qualify for an anti-IL-5 therapy, they need to have an exacerbation and they need to have peripheral bloody eosinophilia. Maybe it's at the 300 level, maybe it's at the 150 level. Every drug, everyone's a little different. And if, what about anti-IL-4 receptor therapy? This is for severe eosinophilic type 2 asthma. Again, exacerbations, eosinophilia, or need for oral steroids. What's important to realize is that all of these factors overlap. So a patient who qualifies for one of these therapies probably qualifies for many. And then you have to make the more challenging decision of, is there a better choice for any given patient? And this is an area of unsettled and uncertainty. The greater your eosinophil count, the better you will do with all of these therapies. The lower your eosinophil count, the less likely you are to have a great response. The more exacerbations you've had, the better these therapies are likely to work. Some of them have concomitant indications for secondary conditions like nasal polyposis or atopic dermatitis. So if those are present, um, using a therapy that, that uh, goes after two or three disease states simultaneously, um, there's pretty good rationale for thinking about that. So if we look overall at what these do, and this is generally the data from adults, we see that Reduction of exacerbation is the most consistent clinical effect of all of the biologics. They have all demonstrate reduction in the risk of exacerbations. The magnitude of that reduction ranges from a low of about 25% to a high of about 70%. Does that mean that the therapy that does 25% is not the best therapy for any given patient? It isn't. Some of these studies were designed differently. The patient populations were not identical or interchangeable. So some of these findings may relate more to study population than drug efficacy. So it's important to keep those factors in mind. If we think about biologics in children age 6 to 11, you know, because that's the patient that we're taking care of, he's almost 6, we see that there are four studies in omalizumab that have been completed that have demonstrated reduction in exacerbations. We'll talk about those. 
Mepolizumab has two trials, one an FDA uh, pharmacokinetics trial that I'll describe in a moment that showed reduction in eosinophils, and a trial that we're doing as part of the Inner City Asthma Consortium called Muppets 2, which is an efficacy trial um, in uh, children and adolescents uh, with uh, severe eosinophilic exacerbation prone asthma. And finally, we'll talk about a trial in dupilumab in children 6 to 11 with uncontrolled asthma. So omelizumab, this is the ICATA study. This is a study of 419 children living in the inner city, severe allergic asthma, given omelizumab or placebo for a year, demonstrated a significant reduction in the rates of exacerbation in children who received omelizumab relative to those who received placebo, and a near complete elimination of the seasonal peaks of exacerbation that we would have expected in this study population and in the setting of omelizumab, those are markedly diminished. So significant effects on exacerbations. Here's a second trial called PROS. This was done a little differently. This shows sort of the rapidity with which these therapies can be effective. 500 children, inner city asthma, allergic disease, and at least one recent exacerbation. They were run in to have asthma control over the summer, randomized to receive omelizumab or doubling their inhaled corticosteroids um, in July and August prior to return to school. They went back to school and we followed them for 90 days receiving omelizumab, inhaled corticosteroid boost or placebo to see um, what effect this would have on their exacerbations. And what we found is that in the study population overall, if you received omelizumab, your chance of having an asthma exacerbation was reduced by about 50%. Pretty excellent. But this effect was almost entirely in the children who received the highest level of care. Those who were on step five therapy actually had a 63% reduction in exacerbation, whereas those who were on step two, three, or four care actually did no better on omelizumab than they did on placebo. And it's also important to acknowledge that we did this group that doubled up their inhaled corticosteroids prior to going back to school, and that had no effect relative to placebo either. So the effect here was an omelizumab effect, and it was most evident in the patients on the highest degree of therapy. What about mepolizumab? This is the only published trial in children 6 to 11. It's an open-label pharmacokinetic study, 36 children, to demonstrate that the exposure to either 40 milligrams of mepolizumab if they weighed less than 40 kilos or 100 milligrams of mepolizumab if they weighed 40 kilos or more every four weeks for 12 weeks resulted in comparable exposure that would have been seen in adults from their PK experience. They also looked at eosinophil counts, asthma control, exacerbations. But remember, this is an open-label, non-controlled, no placebo arm comparator study. They found that the mepolizumab exposures were a bit higher and the apparent clearance was a little lower than expected, but not tremendously so. Mepolizumab reduced eosinophils as would have been expected. They reduced by 89% in the 40 milligram group, 83% in the 100 milligram group. They saw numerical quote unquote improvements in ACQ7 and ACT based on baseline factors. Um, 10 children had 13 exacerbations during the 12 week period and 13 children had exacerbations over the 20 weeks, including four ED visits and or hospitalizations. So they, not exacerbation free by any extent, but um, these were children who had exacerbations previously. There was no change in FEV1. They wanted to demonstrate that, that this anti-IL-5 therapy reduced IL-5 levels, but the IL-5 levels at the beginning were below the limit of detection in 78% um, of patients, and safety was comparable to prior studies. Here's a paper um, looking at adolescents treated with mepolizumab as part of the, the uh, Mensa and Muska trials, and then them as a meta-analysis in the lowest panel. And what you see is that the this is the reduction in exacerbations or the risk of exacerbations. And what you see is that the 12 to 17 year olds have estimated exacerbation rates that are comparable to the adults, but they have very, very wide confidence intervals because the sample size here is tiny. Again, it's only 34 adolescents. So we're still pretty limited as to what we really understand about mepolizumab and the management of childhood um, asthma. This is the Muppets trial I alluded to earlier. 
uh, year-long trial of mepolizumab versus placebo on top of guideline-based care in children 6 to 17 with difficult-to-control asthma, two prior exacerbations in eosinophilia. Um, this study uh, just completed, and uh, you should expect to see findings um, by the spring, I would think. Benralizumab has not had uh, pediatric dedicated trials either. This is a follow-up of the 86 adolescents who were in the phase three Kalima and Sirocco trials and then followed in the Bora study for two additional years. Again, we're talking a grand total of 86 children, who the adolescents, not children, who were then rolled over into the ex open label extension phase. And they looked at exacerbation rates um, and lung function in very um, qualitative ways because, again, there is no, since it's an open label study, there are no placebo arms to compare it to. And what you see is that their annualized exacerbation rates are around a half an exacerbation per patient. At baseline, they were all greater than one. This suggests that there's an improvement. Maybe it's a bit greater in those who had eosinophil counts in excess of 300. Um, but I think the one takeaway point is that 69% of the patients who were receiving every eight week benralizumab during the Bora study remained exacerbation free. And the safety profile was comparable to that seen in adults. Last thing I want to talk to you about is the VOID study. This is a study that we just um, completed and reported on this spring. This is dupilumab in children aged 6 to 11 with uncontrolled moderate to severe asthma. Year-long double-blind placebo-controlled phase 3 trial. Children randomized 2 to 1 to dupilumab that was dosed based on age every two weeks um, or matching placebo for 52 weeks. They could then enter either an open-label extension or uh, a follow-up post-treatment. We included children 6 to 11, persistent moderate to severe asthma for at least 12 months. Um, they had to be receiving medium-dose inhaled corticosteroid with a second controller or high-dose inhaled steroid alone or with a second controller. Their lung function had to be 95% or less or have a ratio of less than 85% and had to have FEV1 reversibility of at least 10% and have had a severe exacerbation in the past year and remained uncontrolled during run-in. We analyzed them as two primary analysis populations, those who had evidence of type 2 disease based on a blood eosinophil count of at least 150 or a pheno level at baseline of at least 20 parts per billion. We also looked at children who had classic eosinophilic asthma with a baseline eosinophil count of at least 300. But we also looked at populations where the eosinophil cutoff was 150, the pheno cutoff was 20, and the entire population is intent to treat. Primary outcome was rate of exacerbations, requiring oral steroid or emergent care. Key secondary was the percent change in FEV1. This is the general study population in those who had the type 2 inflammatory phenotype or the bloody eosinophil count of at least 300. It's pretty clear that these children had moderate to severe asthma. They averaged two and a half exacerbations in the prior year. Um, their lung function was more compromised than has been seen in other trials in the high 70% range. They had FEV1 reversibility in the 15 to 20% range. Their blood eosinophil counts, remember these all had to have been at least 150 um, to be considered in the type 2 profile. Um, their eosinophil counts were 5 to 700. Their total IgEs were about 400 to 600. Their phenos, despite medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroids, were 28 to 35. And at least half to two-thirds of patients had a pheno of at least 20. Here's the primary outcome. Here's the rate of uh, relative risk of exacerbation relative to placebo. Children with the type 2 phenotype and those who had bloody eosinophil counts less than 300 experienced a greater than 50% reduction in risk of exacerbations relative to placebo. Similar magnitudes were seen for those with bloody eosinophil counts of at least 150, phenos of at least 20, and in the entire population irrespective of these findings. Here's the reduction in exacerbations by the subphenotypes, so 59% in the type 2, 
65% if the S&P foot counts were over 361%, if they were over 150, 62% if they were over, if your pheno was at least 20. And all pop, and the entire population, including those who had no evidence of type 2 inflammation, was still significant at 54%. Here's the improvement in lung function, very similar pattern. We saw significant improvement of about five percentage points over baseline in children who received dupilumab over placebo in all of the groups that we studied, especially those with type 2 inflammation or eosinophilia in excess of 300. So when we look at these biologics across the board, we see that we have different targets. We have slightly different indications. We have a variety of age ranges, which um, may change over time. The dosing for some of these uh, is age-dependent. Some of it will be weight-dependent. Um, they're all given sub-Q. Um, most are now available for home administration every two, four, eight weeks, depending on the product. Um, the eosinophil counts required for these really do vary, and uh, every insurance company is a little different in what they want to see from you. But generally, 150 to 300 is eosinophilia um, in the present era. But we need more. You know, as we've seen for bepolizumab in children 6 to 11, as of now, there's a PK study published with 36 patients. There are no data in resolizumab. There are no data for benralizumab. And now we have the data for 400-plus children with dupilumab. So we still need much more pediatric-derived data. So let's get back, back to our case. It's important to see that, you know, our, our patient has significant type 2 disease. He's got eosinophilia. He's got markedly elevated IgE. He has significant allergic sensitization. So given his young age and that there was nothing else available, this was in 2017, we went and uh, despite his uh, total IgE level, um, we, through a shared decision-making approach, um, thought that initiation of a biologic was appropriate. So we recommended omalism have 300 milligrams every two weeks. That was on July the 19th. Four weeks later, before it could be approved by the insurers and administered, he had a uh, terrible event. He woke up with symptoms of asthma, got three albuterol treatments, felt a little better. Four hours later, got an additional albuterol treatment. And then went to a birthday party, needed some albuterol there, and, and mom thought that that was a little more than, than she should have uh, than she wanted to see, so they left for the local ED. In the, in the car on the way there, he lost consciousness. CPR was initiated. He was brought to Children's Hospital, admitted to the pediatric ICU, where over the next week it was clear that he had severe hypoxic ischemic brain injury. And uh, after a uh, difficult discussion, he was terminally extubated and passed away um, on the 31st. So, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a tragic outcome of severe asthma. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Um, had he gotten the omalizumab, would this event have been avoided? We don't know. Maybe, maybe not. That's what we were trying to do. I think one of the reminders that this tells me is that, you know, sometimes we just keep putting off these decisions. Well, let's try this and see how he does, and then come back in two months and let's see this and see this and see this. The writing was on the wall for this child. We knew that he was going to have bad disease. And, you know, I think once you know that you're there, you're there, and you need to start moving these discussions forward because every exacerbation, unfortunately, has the potential to end like this. Fortunately, most of them don't. Um, but I think it's just a reminder, a sobering reminder, that time isn't always there, that the ability to see, well, let's see how the next thing does, is not always our best strategy. So what we've seen today is that we have many phenotypes of asthma, um, although the biologic pathway of the endotype remains unclear for most. Um, there are five biologics approved for asthma, all of them target type 2 inflammation, all lead to reductions in exacerbations. Their effects on lung function and biomarkers are less consistent. And we have data, but not a whole lot, of, of anti-L5 and anti-L4 in children. We need more, but I think we're getting there. We have and are unlikely to get direct head-to-head -head comparisons of any of these agents to date, and indirect treatment comparisons are available. There are these network meta-analyses. They're also inconsistent and really don't tell the full story, so I, I 
encourage folks to read them, but interpret them with a giant grain of salt. And finally, I think it's really clear we need future studies to fully understand how to choose between our available options among patients who almost always have overlapping phenotypes. So I'll stop there and be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bacarrier. We really appreciate that. Um, I know I learned a lot, and I think, you know, in my year plus of fellowship, I haven't seen all too many of these severe asthmatics, and so it's, uh, I think, a really important uh, presentation to, to review this management and hopefully lead to preventing bad outcomes like the one that, that you shared with us. Um, so thank you. Uh, for everyone else out there, yeah, we do have some time for questions. If you want to unmute and ask or um, drop it in the chat, I can read it off as well. Okay, I see uh, one just showed up in the chat. It says, is there any role for a llama in severe pediatric asthma? And also, what do you think about chronic azithromycin? Yeah. Both very good questions. So llamas are, are widely available. Um, the triple inhalers have not been studied in children, so I don't think we should be discussing those. The role of teotropium in children, it does seem to provide a little added benefit in terms of lung function, maybe a modest improvement or modest reduction in exacerbation risk. Um, I will often try it as I'm trying to get our um, trying to get the insurance process in place for a biologic as sort of a bridge to biologics. Um, clinical experience suggests to me that um, it's not a game changer for the majority of patients, but it's it's a safe therapy that we can consider adding. But I've not seen tr as as robust a response as one would hope. Chronic azithromycin has been pretty well studied in adults. Um, it's within the GINA document as a consideration, especially in those who have no evidence of type 2 disease. Um, so I've not made a habit of using chronic azithromycin in children with asthma without having better clinical trial data to support its use. I know there are others who try it and feel like maybe it helps. We do need to keep in mind that it is, it, it, it's relatively safe, but antibiotic resistance is always a concern, and, and we want to sort of be good stewards of, of the drugs we have and not give our microbes any um, uh, pressure to evolve into more um, evil organisms. Um, so I think, it depends, depending on the situation, I would think about it. If you have a patient with severe asthma who doesn't qualify for biologics, who doesn't have evidence of type 2 disease, that's where I would think about it. But if you have evidence of type 2 disease, I would definitely have a biologic discussion before I would have an azithromycin discussion. All right, and then I see a question about uh, which biologics are approved for children at this point. So at this point, omalizumab goes down to six. Uh, mepolizumab goes down to six. Um, dupilumab goes down to 12. Benralizumab goes down to 12. Reslizumab goes down to 18. So that's where they are. How do you use them? How long should you be on them? Our general rule is you try them for four to six months, and then you reassess. Um, if you're clearly having an improvement, you continue. If you're not improved, and what not improved is, is, is a matter of debate. Um, you know, having an exacerbation on a biologic is not a failure of the biologic. Remember, a lot of these patients have two, three, four, five exacerbations in the prior year. You go on a biologic and you have one or two. That's a win. That is an improvement. That is a response. So just because you exacerbate does not mean that you have failed a therapy. But even patients who look like they will respond to these therapies don't respond to a given therapy. If I have a patient who clearly is not getting better with one of the biologics 
and they qualify for a different category of biologic, I will try that. So if you start with an anti-IL-5 and they don't respond and they qualify for an anti-IL-4, I will try that. Or if they respond, to, you know, if they qualify for an anti-IgE, I will try that. There are plenty of patients who you don't get it right the first time, and that's just not the end of the world. Um, it's like every other therapy. There are no absolute predictors of success or response. You have to reassess, and then you have to make a good decision as to when to continue. Now, patients who do well for years, what do you do about them? There are no data to help us here. Some people go to less frequent administration. Some people try to stop. You know, can you reduce, reduce inhaled corticosteroids in the setting? None of these things have been well studied. So this is, this is where sort of the artistic elements of, of medicine really have to come into play and have these very thoughtful discussions with your patients about what to go, uh, or about where to go next. We yeah, see one other question. What about the effectiveness of Montelukast? I think Montelukast has its role um, in mild disease more often than not. Um, in children on inhaled corticosteroids, there's a subgroup who, when you add Montelukast, really do get much better. Um, so I think it's still a therapy that is out there. You know, it, it's it's a relatively safe therapy, but remember that it has a um, recently applied black box warnings for neuropsychiatric effects. Um, and these are, you know, these there are some scary reports of patients having bad neuropsychiatric outcomes associated with this that really led to this black box warning. So I think we need to, to think about it a little more carefully than has been done previously. Um, but I think most of our patients are going to have a trial of it. And for some of them, it will make a very big difference. We don't have good biomarkers at the present time to predict who those patients are going to be. Um, but I think it's, it, it remains in our armamentarium. Um, we'll still use it. Um, but in the patients with severe asthma, it really doesn't um, add too much for the majority of patients. All right, one more question. Side effects or even risks that we should talk about? Um, I, you know, I think we have to have a very legitimate, honest discussion. And there are tools out there that compare column to column, side by side, the side effects of these therapies. They're all really quite safe. But every therapy that we use has a collection of side effects. We have to be upfront and honest about them. I think that they are really pretty minimal um, in terms of their overall risk. Mont or with omalizumab, you have to be clear that anaphylaxis is a risk and injectable epinephrine has to be available. Um, for its administration. That doesn't hold true for any of the others. They all have a side effect of anaphylaxis, but none of the others have a boxed warning for anaphylaxis, so they don't need an EpiPen um, prescribed. All of them have injection site reactions. Some a little more, some a little less, generally get better over time. Some of them have, you know, peculiar um, drug-specific side effects. So with mepolizumab, I talk about zoster, with dupilumab, you talk about peripheral blood eosinophilia that may or may not have a clinical consequence. Omalizumab, you talk about um, um, anaphylaxis as the most uh, concerning adverse event. None of these are associated with increased risk of malignancy. None of these are associated with other substantial adverse outcomes. So I think you have to to phrase them all in that in that general way. Um, but these side effects, if you look at the clinical trials, very few patients discontinue the therapy because of side effects. I think the clinical benefits are pretty substantial for the majority of patients, and the side effects are pretty infrequent, modest, and manageable. All right, one more. Side effects for prolonged high-dose inhaled steroids. High-dose inhaled steroids, I think, the, the, you know, the key is try to get to lower doses whenever possible. I think many patients on high-dose inhaled steroids are also getting frequent oral courses of steroids. I think those patients deserve um, regular monitoring for um, cataracts. Regular eye exam is it's appropriate. And whether or not they need regular monitoring of bone density is unclear. <laughs> 
um, whether monitoring their vitamin D status and repleting vitamin D inf- impacts any of that, I think is still um, an open question for debate. I think you just got to keep in mind that that's the case. And it, to me, it isn't as much that they're getting the high dose inhaled steroid. It's that if they're really getting that, they're probably getting relatively frequent oral steroid bursts. And that's the, the real risk factor. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Bakarier, I guess if you wait long enough, all the questions come out. So <laughs> we Never had, some, had some silence there, but then a, a slew of questions. So we really appreciate you uh, being willing to answer those. And again, for your presentation, um, we, will, we will let you go and we will um, start getting things ready for our next presentation. Thanks again. All right, stay well. Thanks. Thanks.